Hello, and welcome to the Holistic Living with Luxury Conference, where you will learn unique mindset approaches and practical steps that will allow you to level up in your life and career without sacrificing your body, mind, or soul. I am your host, Christy Garnett. I'm a holistic living empowerment mentor and a clinical herbalist, and I empower successful professionals that want to change their health and their life using natural remedies and mindset awareness. What that means is I I create holistic, customized strategies that my clients can apply to all aspects of their life so they can reach their goals while living with grace and luxury. Today, our guest is Lorraine Miano. For those of you who don't yet know Lorraine, she is a certified health and hormone coach, as well as a postmenopausal woman herself. She discovered her passion for offering menopause advocacy, support, and resources to women in all phases of menopause through health coaching, proper nutrition, and preventative lifestyle choices. She received her certifications as a holistic coach and hormone health expert from the Institute for Integrated Nutrition. She has been able to help even more women by writing and publishing her first book, The Magic of Menopause, A Holistic Guide to Get Your Happy Back. The book helps guide women through the struggles they face as they begin menopause and helps tackle the daily changes such as balancing your hormones holistically, getting a better night's sleep, which is also key, and reducing or eliminating hot flashes, just to name a few. It has been named one of the top 10 books on menopause by the London Evening Standard and has reached number one on Amazon's best sellers list. Lorraine loves to encourage her clients with her mantra. Menopause is not an ending. It is a new beginning. So let's just dive right in. Why don't we? And Lorraine, why don't you tell us what the new beginning after menopause or during menopause can look like and can be? Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on this summit. I'm re- I was really excited to be invited. And um, yeah, I mean, There are so many new things that you can experience in this time of your life. Number one, no more periods. We like to say we'd like to have that white pants party (laughs) to celebrate, (laughs) but women need to go into this time of life actually in a celebration because we can experience new things. We possibly are at a stage in our life where uh, maybe we're getting ready to retire, or maybe we just want a new uh a new career to go into, which is what I did at age 55, became a health coach, wrote my first book at 58. I'm studying to become an aromatherapist now at 63. So there's so many benefits at this stage of our life that we can really look at new relationships, new careers, to pay attention to our hobbies that we maybe put on the back burner while we raised our children and really didn't have time for while we were working. So a lot of women are coming into this age with their new wisdom, um, not giving a crap about what people think anymore, and really just taking it on full force. You know, I love that idea of saying, now you can really pursue what it is you want, not what you thought you should want. (laughs) You know, that changes freedom in that. Yes, that changes. And there's a freedom in that. So tell me what you feel are not only the stages, like from a mental aspect, but what are the stages, not that you feel, but what you know, are the stages from a physical hormonal aspect? Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're talking to women in this audience right now, who may be in their thirties and are in menopause because of, um, you know, a surgery or something like that. Chemically induced. Yeah. Yeah. Chemically induced or talk to me about the stages when it comes from a hormone perspective. Yeah. So the natural stages of menopause, um, actually, so pre-menopause are the years before you reach the menopause years. And that's from puberty up until perimenopause. And perimenopause begins usually in our mid forties. It can begin as early as our thirties, and that could be underlying health conditions besides the surgically or chemically induced menopause. But for the most part, it begins in our mid forties and that can be, and so perimenopause actually means around menopause. And the Mm. term only came about in the early nineties. Before that, we didn't even have a term for it. It was just all menopause. (laughs) So perimenopause is when your hormones are fluctuating, ovaries are shutting down. And for many women that can look like irregular periods, which could be more frequent or less frequent anxiety, low libido, dry vagina, our hair is changing, our moods are changing. There's so many 
um, symptoms that can pop up during these years that are known as common symptoms, but they're not necessarily normal. Mm. And we don't have to experience them. And menopause is actually just one day. It's the 12 month anniversary of when your menses cease. So that is and if you go 11 months and then get a period, you have to start over again, unfortunately. So it's 12 consecutive months with no period, you reach menopause, and then the very next day you're considered postmenopausal, and you will be for the rest of your life. And that could be anywhere from 30 to 50% of a woman's life. And for many women, they think, well, I'm not having hot flashes anymore, so I'm, pa I'm past that. And I recently just wrote an article about that, that you may not be past that because in our postmenopausal years, now that our estrogen levels have declined, we're more susceptible to osteoporosis, to cardiovascular disease, to insulin resistance. So we still really need to pay attention to what we do as far as our health, to pay attention to preventing all of those things happening. You know, I, I love that you're highlighting this one day and then all of a sudden you're put into a category of a totally different slot. And mm -hmm. so why not really celebrate and honor th uh, this new stage and uh, yeah. these phases that we are just now putting terms to, right? Yeah. You know, this is pretty recent, this uh, perimenopause term, yeah, the term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. we've been dealing with it for many, many, many generations. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, and I talk about this a lot, medical misogyny surrounds women's health in general. And when it comes to menopause, there's no difference. I mean, women are going to their physicians and not getting the care that they need because, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not their doctor's fault. They're not being educated in menopause as residents. And hopefully that is changing now. Um, I think now functional medicine is coming into play. Um, menopause.org is also ha has a certification program for physicians that they could take. So women could look there for guidance too. Absolutely. And let's talk about some of the things that um, we can all do, either preparing for menopause or being in a menopause. And what is it that you would say would be some of the really common and practical things that you can do to help um, mitigate your hormones and acknowledge that these things are changing, but not necessarily fight it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I guess I would start with um, women talking to their daughters too at the same time that they're they're going through this in perimenopause because a lot of their daughters are going through puberty about the same time that they may be going through perimenopause. So they could kind of be on, in on this talk together. And I call it the mm -hmm. second talk. A lot of the things that lead up to those years, things that we've done in our life as far as what our diet has been like, what our movement has been like, our stress levels can contribute to the symptoms that we may experience during those years. Genetics is not the only um, call for what will be happening to our bodies. So it's not just our bloodline, it's not just what our mom went through, but it's what we do for ourselves during all of those years. Mm -hmm. So from the get-go, I would say, of course, and people hear this all the time, women hear it all the time, eat a good diet, eat whole foods, and we want to really pay attention to getting rid of the crap that's in our life, all of those processed foods. And for many women, that could also include alcohol and caffeine, unfortunately, because those lead to symptoms. Alcohol can lead to insomnia, anxiety, and caffeine as well. Mm -hmm. So women need to really eliminate those things in their life and boost up the good things. So like eating a lot of greens and fruits and veggies and whole whole um, organic meats and fish and all the good stuff. A Mediterranean diet is actually a wonderful diet for menopausal women because there's a good variety of food in there. And even if you have one glass of wine here and there, that's, a, that's beneficial, actually can be beneficial for women. Just too much alcohol can lead to those symptoms. Um, other things are changing our perception of menopause. That's a big one. Western culture does a great job of making it look awful, like your life is going to end when you reach menopause. If you Google the word menopause, many of the photos are of women fanning themselves or miserable, and it does not have to be that way. So I think if we can flip that switch and really change the perception as they do in other cultures, 
where women during this phase are held in high regard mm -hmm. with respect, you know, their wisdom is something that people will really call upon during those years. And uh, there's something called the grandmother effect where they have the grandmas taking care of the younger children too. So they're given jobs, they're held in high regard. And I think if we look at it more that way, rather than this is the end of your life, it will never be the same. Women feel invisible, unfortunately, and it's because our culture does a good job of doing that to us. So I think changing the perception is, is a big way to go too. You know, I'm so grateful that you brought up the alcohol, uh, the alcohol topic, because well, the clients that I have that are in menopause or perimenopause that are really holding on to alcohol, <laughs> regardless of the, the flushing that it creates, because that yeah. can also be part mm -hmm. of why yeah. they're having these flashing and these flush, I call them flushing, uh, just yeah. because I feel like that's a nicer term than flashes. <laughs> yeah, so. it's actually probably more more indicative of what is really happening. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say, you know, think of the trade-offs. Why are you wanting that wine? Is it a lifestyle choice or do you, are, are you really looking for an anxiety drop or what, what is it that you're wanting to do? So when you have clients that are talking about their diet and wine and caffeine, do you, what, what would be an alternative to that lifestyle choice, so to speak? Yeah. Well, like you said, a lot of women want to drink alcohol to de-stress in the evening and maybe really help them get to sleep. And although it might help them get to sleep initially, initially, it'll cause them to bypass that REM mode. So they're not getting the restorative sleep and then they're waking up hours later. And like mm -hmm. you said, it can cause anxiety and hot flashes or flushes. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> um, but for a lot of women, if you like, I, I actually gave up alcohol back in May for a specific diet that I was doing for um, leptin resistance. And when I say diet, I mean what you do eat, not what you don't eat because you <laughs> need to eat. Okay. <laughs> and so I have felt great since I gave up alcohol altogether. But what I do instead is I'll still have like a, a sparkling what I call mocktail in a, a nice wine glass. I found, you know, seltzers, flavored seltzers and a little bit of flavor. There are actually things called, um, I think one of the companies is called Seedlip, which is like a cocktail mixer, but it's, it's non-alcoholic. So women, <clears throat> excuse me, women can go that route also. You know, yeah. I, I love that alternative. What you're saying is what I really feel is luxury life living and a luxury lifestyle. So mm -hmm. if you're wanting that feeling that wine glass delivers, <laughs> because yeah. a lot of times, whether it's what you can eat versus what you can't eat, a lot of times we're chasing that feeling, that emotion, and not necessarily the effect in the body. So having it in a beautiful wine glass, mm -hmm. It seems like a really practical and a, a mindset shift as well. So yeah, definitely. That's definitely. beautiful. Thank you. So the other thing that I want to circle back to is this conversation with your daughters. So when I am treating my clients and when you are seeing your own patients and clients, are you coming up against this concept of, well, what happened with your own mother? I, it's pretty remarkable that some people don't have those conversations or we don't really know what happened to the generations before us. Do you yeah, find that it, to be true? Unfortunately, menopause has always been like a taboo subject and especially in prior generations, especially mm -hmm. in our culture. So you may not have had the chance. And I, and unfortunately, there's so many women who don't have their moms anymore. So they don't even have someone that they can talk to about it. And their healthcare providers are not really giving them the information that they need. So I encourage women now that are going through menopause. And even if you're not, really do your research on it and talk to your daughters about it now. They actually should be educating them in school along with every, you know, as they go through puberty and they get the talk in school, they really should be including menopause too. And not just for girls, but for the guys too, because the guys will be dealing with women their, their entire lives, right? They will be um, possibly married. They may have a boss who's a woman or an employee who's a woman. And to be able to understand what they are going through and 
appreciate the, the changes that they're going through and maybe even provide some comfort for them would be so beneficial for them to learn at an early age. So specifically for the, the daughters, they can understand that a good way to explain it, even though it's not quite that way is menopause is like reverse puberty. So mm -hmm. your hormones are kind of shutting down and you're going back to pre-hormone, like pre-puberty. So you don't have those sex hormones anymore. There are other hormones that are so important, right? Our cortisol, insulin, all of those leptin, so many hormones in our body that are responsible for so many other things in our body. But we tend to talk about our sex hormones during menopause, uh, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. So talk to your daughter about those things now. Let her know that the choices that she makes, and they can be simple choices for exercise and health and eating well, um, doing all those things from an early age may prevent her from ever having those symptoms later. Of course, you're not, you may not talk to a 13 year old as, as, as much as you would maybe a 20 year old daughter about those things, because they, they might not want to hear that. But you talk to a 20 year old about possibly having a dry vagina in their forties or fifties, you might get their attention um, because th those can be debilitating symptoms for women. So Absolutely. really take the time. Yeah. Take the time to talk to your daughters. Now they can make, do simple things, take simple steps now and have a wonderful, and what I call a magic menopause later. Yes. And you know, this is, I love how you brought up the dry vagina because let's talk about that. Let's talk about, um, options because mm -hmm. these are the things that really can kind of shift ourselves and thinking, oh my goodness, we're really on this downward spiral. Yeah. Right. So yeah. how is it that somebody can kind of, um, make a lifestyle choice to prevent dryness, vaginal dryness. Yeah. So unfortunately when estrogen declines along, estrogen is responsible for um, body fluid levels, uh, different things. That's why you may have dry hair, skin, uh, vagina, eyes, all, all kinds of things. But what, what every woman, woman can do from an early age and is moisturize your vagina daily, the same way you would moisturize your face. And that'll prevent a lot of that atrophy from happening. Um, different things that women can do during their perimenopause and menopause years, if they do have a dry vagina, and that is to use lubrication during sex. And I would so highly suggest doing your research. And I've curated products for women that are safe and have um, no toxic ingredients in them, but you can use coconut oil at home. That's, uh -huh. that's a good one to use. But if you do, you cannot use condoms with that because it, it can break down the integrity of the condom, anything with oil based, but there are aloe based ones that you can use. Um, there's so many organic ones. I've, I, and I have them in my menopause market on my website. Um, unfortunately, when women do have dry vaginas, that could lead to a low libido because they're fearful, you know, because our brain obviously is our largest sex organ. Right. <laughs> and if you're fearful of pain during sex, that's going to put a kibosh on it. So if we can really pay attention of taking care of our vaginal tissue from an early age, and talk to your daughters about that too. It's something you can just do every day, very simply, and then pay attention as you go um, through your perimenopause and menopause years, look into um, possibly taking supplements like hyaluronic acid is a good one. Pycnogenol is another one. Um, there are actually moisturizers that have hyaluronic acid in them that you could use vaginally too. So all of these are options for women and they do not have to suffer. And, you know, I love that you brought up your brain as the strongest sex organ, because this is another aspect that people can really use. So allow yourself the time to get in the mood, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Instead of thinking that your body is of service <laughs> to someone else, yeah. what are you going to receive out of this experience? How can you speak to that a little bit more yeah. and how that will impact not just the physiological aspect of dry vagina, but maybe there's a, there's a psychological aspect yeah. here too. Yeah. I, I tell women all the time, you deserve good sex. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are. Do you remember how good that felt? You deserve good sex. Mm -hmm. So really paying attention to how we can set, like you said, set the mood. I have a thing I, I talk about called hug therapy. And, you know, when we hug, uh, oxytocin is uh, the, the, happy, the happy hormone that's automatically released. 
So if you start with some hug therapy with maybe not having it lead to anything sexual, just do like 30 second hugs here and there, um, especially if you're having relationship issues because of low libido, either the male or the female partner, or um, if same sex partners, if one of them is having the, the low libido, start with some um, good hug therapy a little bit, add a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit more each day and see where that can lead. That's one way to do it. And of course, like setting the mood, candles, um, a romantic dinner, um, having um, couples massages is a wonderful way too, because that relieves stress. And for women, women need to be stress-free to have sex. Men use it as a stress reliever. So I think that if you can get that massage going, that could be beneficial as well. And kind of really set the tone for the relationship to um, take it to the next step. You know, you mentioned earlier about aromatherapy. And one of the other things that I think you are referring to in this setting of the mood is and an atmosphere, an environment, whether that's candles or touch, um, the, you know, the, that 30 second hug, test it out. It's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot longer than people realize. Yeah. And you don't have to speak, together. no speaking, just hugging. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no speaking, but you know, how long is a hug normally like test it out and see where your comfort level yeah. is. But you're referring to all those senses. So even a, a great smelling essential oil, you know, that would be a, a mood lifter, like a, you know, and like I highly, citrus. even over candles, I highly recommend an essential oil diffuser. <laughs> exactly. There's so many wonderful oils for women. Um, Clary Sage is one of my favorite, and that's a really wonderful one for women's hormone balance. So even just putting some of that in diffuser. Yes. Beneficial. Like you're speaking my language because <laughs> that not only helps the hormonal piece, like you mm -hmm. were mentioning, but it also sets the mood and the tone. And mm -hmm. I agree with you when it comes to, um, having people deserving great sex. The, uh, the one thing that I want to also circle back to is permission to have that with yourself. Because yes. I think that's one of the things that is missing in perimenopause or menopause, postmenopausal women is this idea that you can't have pleasure in your own body. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a wonderful company and it was started by a daughter for her mom. It's called Tabu, T-A-B-U. I have it in my menopause market. And she created... Um, self-love tools for menopausal women, because sometimes we just need to help ourselves a little bit, especially if we are having vaginal atrophy and vaginal dryness, and we've not, we're not comfortable yet to really go that next step with our partner. We can have self-pleasure and actually lubricate and provide that benefit that we need for our vaginal tissue without having that tab taboo that surrounds it. Because unfortunately, there is a term use it or lose it. And um, if we're not if we're not using our vaginal tissue, if we're not having sex, then we can it can lead to more atrophy and pain. You know, and this is the whole point to having this conversation with you and bringing you on as an expert to be able to take that myth those myths and those misconceptions that you can't have pleasure during menopause or postmenopausal, you, there's this, um, perception that there's something dirty or wrong. And so are there any other myths or myths, misconceptions that you'd like to touch on while we're, while we're here? Because I think you just handled, handled that beautifully. I think, um, well, weight gain is a big one for women, unfortunately, and it's, they feel like it's inevitable that they will gain weight, they will never lose it. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And why I talk about weight gain, and I, I don't like to talk about like, um, I want women to have a positive body image and weight is not everything. When yeah. I refer to weight gain, it's the health aspect of it. And unfortunately during menopause, cortisol, cortisol levels can rise and that can lead to that belly fat around the middle, which is indicative of possible cardiovascular disease later. So we wanna really pay attention to um, what we can do, what the things that I talked about, about as far as our diet, our exercise movement. And I'd like to just touch on that for a second on movement because women are under the impression that they have to do extreme exercise. And on, when we come into our perimenopause and menopause years, that actually works 
against us. It works against our hormones. We want moderate exercise because exercise actually raises cortisol levels. And if you're running marathons, if you're doing CrossFit all the time or heavy lifting, now weight tra um, resistance training is good for bone growth for you know building bones. But we don't, we don't want to do excessive stuff because it will raise our cortisol levels and actually cause hormone imbalance in our bodies. But if we do a moderate exercise, walking, eating correctly, um, we, it'll benefit everything in our bodies. I think that's a great, great point to mention this pushing, 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 because we're at a place where, especially if you're, if you're really, um, a type A high achiever, you know, that push is actually the detriment. It, yeah. It's giving you the opposite of what you want, but yeah, you've had 30 mean. years of saying, mm -hmm. well, I'll just push harder, push farther. I'll rest later. And what you're just saying is, you know, like be moderate about this, you know, mm -hmm. do a dance, walk, do something with resistance, but don't, um, push yourself to the point of making you feel poorly. Right. And it, and it could actually work in the reverse as far as our weight gain too. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, yeah. And, oh. and eating too little can do that too. We actually need to eat a good, healthy diet. Don't and restrict what calories. That? What does that look like? Because what I find is that as we age, we're sitting there and maybe our, maybe our, um, appetite changes. And mm -hmm. so, you know, those three square meals a day versus the snacking, you know, as, um, someone who's really uh, an expert in nutrition, where, where can we go? What are the tips for that in terms of appetite and, you know, high protein, low protein? I know you mentioned the Mediterranean diet, yeah, but can you speak good, more to that? Yeah. Um, for many women, First of all, we're all bio individuals. So what works for one may not work for another. Like you, like you indicated, you know, your appetite may be different. Some women like to fast for 12 hours and maybe not have breakfast until later in the morning. And that works for their body. So we really have to do, I, I, I think food journaling is a good way to start mm. just to see what your body is experiencing. Write down everything that you are eating the times that you eat and how you feel an hour later, a couple of hours later, and then look back and see what wasn't really agreeing with my body. Uh, am I getting enough energy from what I'm eating? So you can really keep track that way. Am I, am I gaining weight that maybe I didn't want to gain um, by incorporating some of these foods? Uh, am I having gastro problems? You know, our gut health is so important too. So really paying attention to bowel movements and bloating and that kind of thing. And then also how you're feeling. Maybe your hormones are a little out of whack because of certain ways you're eating or times you're eating. Um, so a food journal is a great way to keep track of that. Specifically what we can eat, like I said, whole foods, the more vegetables, the better, you know, if you, I'm a flexitarian, so I will eat, <laughs> I will eat fish, I will eat meat, but I try not to eat, you know, large portions of that. Um, I try to eat as much vet, uh, vegetables as I can make me maybe making at least half to three quarters of my plate vegetables and, um, and limiting, um, limiting the processed foods, all of the processed sugars. Um, I don't say I do not agree with low fat diets at all. We need healthy fats for our mm -hmm. brains and for our hormones. Our hormones are created from cholesterol. So we want to really pay attention to eating like good fats in our bodies. So like avocados, wild caught fish, olive oil, um, nuts and seeds, and um, all of those kinds of things that will really benefit every part of our bodies. I love that you are a flexitarian, first of all, that's <laughs> amazing. But I also love the fact that you are a proponent of fat and of journaling how you feel based on the food you're eating. So we kind of miss that in calorie counting or, or whatever that was in the past yeah. that people yeah. would do, but journaling based on how you feel is so mind blowing. I, I just think that's so amazing to talk about. I know that we could talk all day about all of this because I'm so passionate and you are as well, but I, you are offering uh, everyone who's watching a free gift. And I would love for you to take the time to explain what that free gift is all about and what um, they will benefit from receiving that gift. 
Yeah. So it's the seven day self-love challenge. And so for seven days, you'll receive in your email every day, a different prompt for that day to help you show yourself some love. Um, we really need to take time for self-care. That's one of the luxuries we don't give ourselves. And so we really need to pay attention to how we can benefit our own bodies by saying no, asking for help when we need it, putting ourselves on our calendar and keeping the appointment <laughs> just as you would any other important appointment. And so every day you'll just receive a little prompt of what you could do that day to help yourself really have more self-love. I love it. I think this is a fantastic gift. I think more people in the world need self care and self luxury. And so for anybody who wants Lorraine's get Lorraine's gift, please click the button underneath this video. That's where you'll find her gift as well as um, her contact information. It's been so fabulous talking with you today and you've shared so much value. I'm just wondering if you have a takeaway point for everyone that they can really sink their teeth into later um, as the day progresses. I would say just look at this phase of life as it's a natural phase and look at it with a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. Look for inspiration in every day because there's so much to be grateful for as we go on and live life. I want you all to live life um, with a long health span versus disease span. And to end with, listen to your body when it whispers so you don't have to hear it scream. Oh, beautiful. I love it. It That makes all the difference in the world, listening to your body when it whispers so you don't have to hear it scream. Well, Lorraine, thanks again for joining me today. And for all of you who are watching, may you walk holistically with luxury from this point forward. Thanks again.